two words said about this man ring loud and long across his career, family, and life. Those words are so much. So much history in his DNA. His grandfather, Matt Jack Rabb, was quite a character. Born a slave, he died a businessman and squeezed so much living in between. Mad Jack Rabb escaped slavery not by running away. He paid money to buy his freedom. He raised a family, including Mike's father, Alan Lewis Rabb, who inherited Mad Jack's meat market. This second-generation businessman married Mike's mother, Emma Fernandez, in 1897. The couple had eight children. Two did not survive, but the six that did live added so much more to the family legacy. I remember the brother who had my father send me to Tuskegee. I remember him telling me about my mother. He, of course, he knew my mother much longer. But uh, he told me, he said, my mother always thought that when I was born that I was going to die because two died just before me. And he said, and my mother said, I know he's going to die, talking about me. I know he's going to die. And, uh, but, uh, but I didn't. Raised amidst profound dignity, class, and style, the world outside was a stark contrast. Mike and his siblings could have been crushed by the cruel injustices that prevailed in Columbus, Mississippi during his childhood. A sad example was the race-based policy that denied Mike a full education. In Mississippi, people of my color will only go to the 10th grade, as it was, they would let you go. In spite of this environment, the Rab children flourished. Mike's brother, Jack, was a professional classical musician who played the violin. Another brother, Beverly Rab, was a World War I veteran. And then there was Peter Rab, who started life in the Deep South and migrated to the Windy City where his associates were violent, unrepentant criminals. Peter Rabb worked for the notorious Chicago gangster, Al Capone. The two remaining brothers are both connected to Mike's Tuskegee University experience. Like Mike, Alvin Rabb was educated there, and Maurice Rabb is partially responsible for getting Mike there. Maurice, 14 years older than Mike, would become a successful doctor and champion civil rights leader in Kentucky. Maurice and his father gently pressured Mike into leaving Columbus, Mississippi to further his education at Tuskegee Institute High School. Mike was only 13 years old when he arrived and not happy about being in this new place. And I just cried all the way to Tuskegee, cried every day I was here wanted my father to let me come home. My father wouldn't do anything but send me some more money. <laughs> but, uh, but that's just the life I had the first year. So much happened during those early years. A scolding from Dr. George Washington Carver for a wrong answer. He said, young man, do you know what kind of tree this is? I looked up here, looked like, oh, I don't know. He started to walk away, he grabbed me. And he reprimanded me for not knowing that that was an oak tree. And uh, he, told, he gave me a lecture. I still didn't know who he was. He looked like a bum. After I, he released me, and I started to walk away. And the young man said, boy, do you know who that was you were talking to? I said, no. He said, that was Dr. Carver. I said, well, who is this? And I said, well, who in the hell is Dr. Carver? I don't know a thing about him. But, uh, but, but that's the way I met him. But I found out that he was a very important man. More prodding from his older brother about advancing his education. He said, Mike, now it wasn't so bad. Now, why don't you just stay here and finish college? So I said, oh, Maurice, 
all right, I'll stay here for you. And I stayed here and I finished college. His first job, which he secured during the Great Depression, at a time when jobs were scarce, was in the school cafeteria. When the manager discovered Mike had a college degree, he boosted Mike to assistant manager. During this time, Mike had more encounters with Dr. Carver. I was in charge of all of the storerooms and all of the all of the grocers and things that came in. Well, most of our stuff came from this from from the agriculture side. But among the stuff that came from the agriculture side was the meat. When they came to the cafeteria, they had a walk-in refrigerator with all the stuff hanging up, you see. So it was my job to take Dr. Carver around to let him go in the walk-in refrigerator to cut fat meat off of his off of the carcasses for him to take over to his dormitory. Dr. Carver cooked all of his meals. He didn't eat any way else. He got to the point where he, where he couldn't do anything and eventually the, the school brought him from the dormitory to Dorothy Hall. That's where he died. On the road to professional success, he detoured for life-altering personal business. It involved a pretty girl named Mary Anna Hutcherson who caught Mike's attention as soon as she got off the train. And she walked right on through the crowd and walked right on up towards the Sage Hall going to Whitehall to register. And my eyes followed her from the time she got off, the, off that train all the way up to Sage, past Sage Hall, as far as I could see. Their love would blossom into marriage and they would become parents to a daughter. Marsha Ann Rabb. Mike's career was on the fast track. He was appointed head of the school's labor office. In those days, all students had to work. There was no paying your way through. Of course, you only had a half a dozen people who could pay their way through, but they had to work. So my job was to give jobs to students. School officials here sent Mike to Columbia University in New York to earn a master's degree involving personnel management. Then he was moved to John Andrew Hospital in the business office and later was chosen to succeed Dr. John Kenny as hospital administrator. Once again, Tuskegee University sponsored Mike's master's degree. The second time, he attended Northwestern University in Chicago focusing on the hospital administration program there. Next, he became assistant to the university president, as well as secretary to the board of trustees. It was a long run from 1927, when Mike came to Tuskegee as a scared adolescent, to his retirement in 1981 as an accomplished executive. Along the way, Mike Rapp has had personal contact with every president at Tuskegee University, except the first one. Dr. Moden, Dr. Patterson, Dr. Forster, Dr. Payton, and Dr. Uh, Roshan. The so much facet to this story has many angles. So much shoulder rubbing with celebrities of the day, legendary boxer Joe Lewis, civil rights icon, Dr. Martin Luther King. So much living with Mariana travels to China to indulge her love of Asian culture, which obviously influenced her furniture and decorating choices. Marcia's graduations from college. And she went to Tennessee State to get a master's degree. Followed by relocation to Buffalo, New York for the start of her career. And then a diagnosis for her that was a kick in the gut for him. She had colon cancer. A few years later, the pain would become so much worse. I remember when my wife was in the bed, I used to call Velma Bray to come over to look at her. 
And um, he, she came over and she put a stethoscope to my wife and she immediately removed it. And she said, Mike, she's dying. That hurt. That hurt. But she was dying. So we got together and got her by uh, got her transported to the East Alabama Medical Center where she died in the emergency room. That was difficult for me. And I have been single ever since then. My wife had died and my daughter had died. By this time, Mike Rabb's entire immediate family was gone. My father died when I first came to Tuskegee. My mother died, and all of my brothers are dead. But he has a large and loving extended family, blood relatives and their spouses, most of whom live in Chicago and Philadelphia. The Rabb family tree extends far and wide with deep roots. Mike's older brother, Dr. Maurice Rabb, was a father figure and mentor to Mike. Maurice Jr. was also a doctor who was like a son to Mike. Maurice Jr.'s son and Mike's grandnephew, Chris Rabb, is an author, consultant, motivational speaker, and genuinely nice guy whose home is in Philadelphia. Chris is the keeper of the family history. Mike is also loved in the Tuskegee community at large and has close relationships with a group of card playing buddies. This game started in 1945 with some prominent Tuskegee men who now are either dead or living somewhere else. Mike is the only original member left. New men join the game to fill vacant spots and they fastidiously maintain the traditions started by their predecessors. One thing that we did then that we don't do now is, uh, I really can't think of things, anything with that, that, that we do now that we didn't do when we started. We only drank beer around, and we never drank whiskey, and we still don't. Mike is also close to the current Tuskegee University president, Dr. Gilbert Rochon. He's invited me to everything. And he always introduces me as the only person that he knows from Tuskegee who knew all of the, who had personal contact with all of the presidents except Booker T. Washington. At the time of this interview, Mike is 99 years old. Still spry and spunky, still driving not only himself, but also providing chauffeur services to his friends. He's just a few months away from his 100th birthday. Celebration plans are not a big priority. Well, I hope I, I hope you can come to my birthday party, but I don't look forward to it. Why? I just, I just don't. I've been pretty good health. One thing I've had happen to me, I got diabetes. And I wear this all the time. Everywhere I go. So much learning, endurance, productivity. And I'm very proud of every way of everything I've done. But I had to be pushed by the presidents to go to, the, to, to graduate school every time. And it scared hell out of me when they called me to come to the president's office for them to tell me <laughs> that I was going. They, they didn't ask me if I wanted to go. They said, we are sending you to where to get your master's degree. That's the way it all happened. So I was forced to go to graduate schools. So much living, love, Peace and serenity. I just have to try to remember to wake up every morning. So I don't know whether I get to a hundred or not. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. But I don't care. 
I got a place down in the cemetery with my name on the, on, on, on the tombstone where my wife is buried. So I'm, I, I'm not particularly concerned about it. But this is my wife and me now. As my daughter told me one time, she said, Daddy, everybody dies. And she was right. So, so I just made a place for myself and my wife.